You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and a contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for the week of June 21st, 2024. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where words still have meaning. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hey, Blue Gal. Hi. And in case you missed it, Drift Glass wants me to pr- announce again. That DGBG Productions has a new video podcast. What might be less exciting for some of you and more exciting for others, it is my knitting podcast. Yeah. You can see my messy office in this week's episode. There are now two episodes up at YouTube, and I'll be doing these uh, 20 to 30 minute shows once a week on Wednesdays. If you love knitting as I do, you are the audience for this show. Please like and subscribe. You should do it. I've listened to both of them. They're awesome. I'm not even uh-huh. a knitter. I think they're awesome. But yesterday, um, you and I were talking about this brand new podcast of yours, this new award-ready podcast, I might add. And I asked you the same question that both of us always ask uh, whenever we're involved in any kind of media project, because we're both writers. Mm-hmm. Who is your audience? This is this is every writer's group I've ever facilitated or edited, or any, anything I've done in the editing department of someone else's work, every script I've ever worked on, every editorial, I've written a lot of editorials. Every time someone has asked about blogging, it's always the same question. Who's your audience? And just as a brief aside, my audience is knitters like me. Yeah, exactly. So people have lots of yarn and a lot of experience. So, yeah. um, But regardless of whether you're podcasting about knitting or politics or whatever it is, Every writer or speaker is addressing someone. So who do they imagine they're speaking to? I often ask that. Who are they talking to? Mm-hmm. Those, those op-ed headline writers in the New York Times. Who are they trying to reach? And by that measure, does the thing they are, are writing or speaking succeed? Right. Or are they not hitting what they are aiming at? Or conversely, are they just talking to no one because they have to crank out 800 words by five o'clock and they don't care? Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Uh, and it can be really annoying. I mean, you know, you asking a writer right off the bat who they think their audience is and who they think they're pitching to. And, you know, if, if they're telling a joke or we're sitting around the, the, the lunch table talking about family, of course, it's not appropriate to treat it as if they were rehearsing a speech to Congress. Mm-hmm. But I have found the usefulness of that very simple question almost always outweighs its potential irritation. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. besides, you know what, Blue Gal? Yeah. I have a much more annoying editorial habit. <laughs> okay, what is yeah. that? <laughs> With which you are very familiar. Uh-huh. So let, let's all do a mind game now. Let's all, let's all use put on our imagination hats. And let's imagine that we're listening to someone telling a story about the time they saw, like, Sandra Bullock in a screaming match with Tilda Swinton in the Peninsula Hotel bar. Okay? He's, remember, he's making this up, folks. I'm completely making this up. This never happened as so far as I know. But remember, details make a story come to life, even if it's completely made-up bullshit like this one is. So, remember, it's not a bar. It's the Peninsula Hotel bar. Huh? It's on the terrace of the Peninsula Hotel bar. And they were drinking Cabernet, but you couldn't tell what the label it was at that distance because you were like 50 feet away. And they just ordered Alu Choke and Chik Shuka. And then suddenly they were yelling at each other. Oh, my God. So the story resumes. This is me being the storyteller now. So she said, you're not all that. And then she said, you couldn't handle that part if they rebuilt it in a lab using your own DNA. So let's stop the story right there. And tell me what's wrong with the story. Uh, well, there's a couple things wrong with it, but why don't you tell me what you think is wrong with the story? Well, it's it's a bugaboo of mine, and I mm-hmm. do it. I, I do it all the time. I do it myself. There are two women in the story, and we, the audience, have no freaking idea which one said what. Ah, yeah. it's just, she said, and then she said, and then she said, and then she said. Now, I'm sure the person telling the story knows exactly what they're talking about. Knows exactly which woman said what. 
And because, and I do this myself, I get in such a hurry to tell the story or to get it on the page that I forget to include really important details. This is why you need an editor. Why most people, need, I need an editor and I don't have one every day, which is why you see a lot of typos in my podcast or my, <laughs> my blog. The, the details are so clear in my mind that I take them for granted that everyone can see them as part of the wallpaper of the story. But their absence leaves the reader who doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about or the listener completely lost. Yeah. Yeah. And so today we're going to talk about how media stories are written and who their intended audiences are supposed to be. Now, is the story purely informational like a rescued dog? Aw. Aw. Or the weather report. You're going to need an umbrella or you're going to need to go to the basement or you're going to need to evacuate. Or it's you know, fine. It's or sunny. Or it's fine. And, it's yeah. hot. <laughs> or is it about a situation where something needs to be done? Mm -hmm. If so, what specifically is the problem? And as you all know from Marketing 101, what is the CTA? What is the call to action? Exactly. What's the specific problem and what's the call to action? That's how stories work. Those kind of stories work. And in that spirit... The word of the day is one you have all heard a million times in the last eight years. And that word is normalize, normalize. Now you think back and ask yourself, how many articles have you read or cable news programs have you watched or radio things you've heard where everyone is warning that we cannot normalize Trump mm -hmm. or that we have already normalized Trump and shame on all of us for doing that. Shame. Well, Normalize literally means to cause something previously considered abnormal or unacceptable to be treated as normal. So all of you thousands of people listening and all the millions of friends you have, all liberals and all good Democrats, by show of hands, how many of you now treat Trump's behavior as normal? Hmm. Or those wild lies Fox News tells every day as normal? or the craven capitulation of the entire Republican Party to Donald Trump as normal. I know we don't. No, we don't, and we never have. Yep. Words that much better describe the attitudes of every liberal we know are ones like rueful, mm -hmm. expressing sorrow or regret, especially in a slightly humorous way. Uh -huh. Dolo do dolorous? Dolorous. Yeah, dolorous. it's a good word. It's a good cross Feeling puzzle, or word. expressing great sorrow or distress. Yes. Mm -hmm. Doleful, full of grief, or even sometimes woeful, full of woe, wretched, unhappy. And on, on my podcast yesterday, the knitting podcast, I talked about catastrophizing. Uh huh. Yeah. What's going to happen if Trump wins? And it just falls, you fall apart, right? right. So, but we never say normal. Oh, no, this is just normal now, right? No. It's never normal. It's a lot of other things, and they're all really bad, but never, it's never fucking normal. Yeah. In other words, um, another word that tangles me up, or other types of words that tangle me up uh, in this context here and bring out my very bad editorial habits are words like we and Americans and the voters and so forth, collective expressions like that. Because when I read a pundit or an essayist use the word we, Part of my brain automatically assumes, well, they're, they're, they're talking about me. must be including me. I'm, a, I'm part of the we, right? Same with Americans and same with voters. I'm an American. I'm a voter. That group must include me. And yet virtually every article that warns that we shouldn't normalize Trump or that Americans want this or the voters won't stand for that is clearly not addressing me or you or the 80 million other Americans who elected Joe Biden in 2020. And for the tens of millions of deeply broken citizens who won't just vote for Trump in November, but adore the fact that he is a monster, that adore him precisely because he isn't normal, they hate normal. And he is the opposite of normal, and they know that. Mm -hmm. He is appealing to them, and his appeal to them is that he will burn normal to the ground. Exactly. He'll kick down doors and drag normal off to deportation camps in the desert. He'll authorize the police to shoot normal. So, and, and normal is destroying America. Right. So we right. have to preserve our country from normal average Americans, right. people who are working, going to work every day. So who exactly is doing all this normalizing? And what exactly is the call to action? 
Yeah. I mean, if it's such ur- so urgent and so dire and we and we and we and Americans and voters, you know, who who are they specifically talking about and what is to be done about it? Now, now you know, I like Tim O'Brien. We see him mm-hmm. on MSNBC. I don't shy away. I don't Michael steal him off the uh, the remote. I stay and watch. But his April 1st, 2024 article in Bloomberg, which I have right in front of me, has this exact problem. Quote, don't normalize Trump's threats of violence. The former president's constant appeals to malice and division can be exhausting, but they are an assault on the foundations of a civil society, unquote. But see, the fact that Trump's constant appeals to malice and division can be exhausting and the fact that they are an assault on the foundations of civil society, those aren't mutually exclusive ideas. Mm -hmm. And exhausting doesn't mean normalizing. It means exhausting. Words have actual meanings. And the article goes on, quote, the road between now and November's presidential election will be unusually long and Trump will continue to pave it with threats of violence and appeals to malice and division, which is true. That's the bile that animates him. Avoiding such bad juju is only natural for anyone exposed to his theatrics and menace. Looking looking the other way offers a measure of solace and continuity in a harrowing, jarring era, unquote, all of which is true. And again, I think Tim is confusing two entirely different things, because as mm-hmm. thorough as we try to be here on the Professional Left podcast, and especially Blue Gal, my adorable wife, who wades through the atrocities of the GOP for crooks and liars five days a week, there comes a time when it's just one too many, one lie mm-hmm. too many. Mm -hmm. One outrage too many. One threat of retribution against a judge too many. And so off goes cable news. And I don't want to watch that anymore. I I don't need to see that anymore. And bye-bye social media. And on go reruns of Legion or Gunsmoke. Or we just dive back into whatever books we're reading or we go out to dinner. But nope, Mm -hmm. nope, nope. We're full, saturated, all done. Because it's just one too many. Yeah. Had enough. Yeah. Because... Basically, dear class, I'm not looking at that monster's face anymore. No. And I don't want to hear his voice anymore. No. He's convinced me that he's a monster and a rapist. Right. I don't need and, to. I... And a cheat. Yeah. I, you don't need to convince me of that. But this profoundly misunderstands our reaction if you think that we're looking the other way. Like probably all of you listening to this and millions more beyond that, our way of coping with the daily fire hose of madness and sedition from the right and from Trump is not to look the other way. Instead, we're just already sold on the fact that they're fascists. Yeah, you want us over, you know. We don't need one more spectacularly stupid thing to come out of Marge Green's mouth to -hmm. convince us that she's a toxic troll and her voters are inbred garbage people. She's already closed that deal with us. We don't need news of one more payoff to Clarence Thomas to convince us that he is Harlan Crow's personal lawn ornament. Or one more flag from Mr. and Mrs. Alito to persuade us that they're curdled 14th century papist hacks. We already know this. And so do you. Yeah. To uh, to misquote a movie line, you had us at fascists. Yeah, you, know? you had us at fascists. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is from CNN 2017, talking about the Muslim ban. Hey, remember the Muslim ban? I Maybe we do. should do a show on that. We have a <laughs> show called No Fair Remembering Stuff. Perhaps we will do that, even though it wasn't that long ago. Quote, don't normalize Trump's vision for America. We must resist. Americans of all backgrounds must understand that Trump's ban is an assault on our core values as a country and as a people. We must ensure that this kind of hatred does not become normalized. Unquote. Now, while the sense of outrage uh, in this article is completely understandable, as an address to the Americans of all backgrounds and we and us and Americans, it's also just silly mm-hmm. because, you know, for Democrats, this is like a call to arms to people who have already heard the call and are already armed and ready, mm-hmm. so to speak, not physically armed, not with weapons, but we're already there. We're already on the barricades. And for Republicans, what can I say? They love this shit. They eat it up. So who else are you calling to action and what is it you expect them to do? What form does this resistance take? For instance, from the Bulwark, January 2024, Jamie Dimon joins the Trump normalizers. And from Reuters, May 31st, 2024, these are both from this year. Uh 
Trump's rich backers normalize criminal behavior. And this is from the Reuters article, quote, even as a New York jury considered Donald Trump's fate, his rich backers stood behind him. Major Wall Street donors, including Blackstone's founder, Stephen Schwartzman, decided to firmly back the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump, who was convicted on Thursday of 34 criminal charges. It's one thing to support a candidate who might cut taxes and regulation, and quite another to endorse a felon. Mm -hmm. After his historic conviction, it's collective greed that's now on trial, unquote. Yes, a handful of rich assholes want their tax cuts more than they want our democracy to survive. That's not normalization. That's capitalism. This is from Politico, March 17th, 2024. Quote, in on the joke, the comedic trick Trump uses to normalize his behavior. These signature set pieces are an utter engine, of course, of Trump's stubborn and undeniable appeal. And humor's always played a part, from repeating ridicule of his rivals, to more impromptu and innocuous asides, to physical pantomimes. The resulting laughter is a constant and key piece of their cadence and pull. This isn't new. And Trump, obviously, is far from the first president or Paul with some capacity for comedy. But over the past few months, at events of his that I've been to in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, it felt to me particularly conspicuous. His destabilizing rhetoric has gotten even more dark. It's what's made the laughter all the more stark, unquote. And I ask you, normalize it to whom? This is literally nothing but a deranged cult leader reading stale jokes from Captain Willie's whiz-bang to a mob of zombies who will literally laugh at anything he says. Mm -hmm. This is just a con man, a common everyday con man, lubing up the chumps and the rubes before he takes them for everything they own. Are certain words creeping into his conversation? Words like... Like swell. Aha! Uh -huh. And so's your old man. But if so, my friends, we got trouble. Oh, we got trouble. Right here in River City. Right here in River City. With a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for... There are even a couple of conservative spins on normalizing Trump. In 2017, the Chicago Tribune gave editorial space to Dan McLaughlin of the National Review, a.k.a. Twitter's unhinged baseball crank, to write this. Quote, why we should normalize Trump. Don't normalize Trump. That's been a mantra for his critics since he won the Republican nomination. Everyone in Washington recognizes that President Donald Trump is not normal. We shouldn't pretend that some of the stranger things Trump does are normal, but he's not going away anytime soon. And the more normal we can encourage him to be the better off we all are. Mm -hmm. Republicans and Democrats alike should try to make this happen. Exactly. Unquote. Exactly. Just like Republicans came to together with Democrats to make sure Barack Obama had a successful presidency. Right, Blue Gal? Yeah, and, and that he was more white, right? He, he yeah. embraced his white side, sure. That they didn't make up crazy <laughs> shit like birth certificates or death yeah. panels or try to derail Obamacare, which is a conservative health care plan to help sick people. No. Everyone, as I recall, came together in the spirit of, of community and harmony to try and, to make and sure. And for, for the good of the whole country, right? Right. Exactly. It was for the good. Because a lot of and people. And apparently, were... it's our responsibility to uh, get more hours with Dr. Phil for Donald Trump so that he can have therapy yeah. and begin, at least pretend to be more normal for America. Oh blue. oh, blue gal. It's our responsibility to do everything. Republicans <laughs> have no agency. They don't have any That's conscience. Right. They don't That's act right. on their own. They only react to us. We are responsible for all things. We are the prime movers. And then there's this speaking of prime movers. Of uh, From First Things, February 15th, 2018. First Things, if you don't know about it, it was more or less the right-wing conservative religious division of the Weekly Standard. Uh, Bill Crystal's wife sat on their board and various Weekly Standard writers wrote for both publications and so forth. Anyway, their premise was, sure, we normalized Trump, but whose fault really was that, Blue Gal? I'll give you one guess who was <laughs> to blame for normalizing Donald Trump. Three, two, one. Yes, 
Quote, how we normalize Trump by Pete Sp- uh, Spilakakos. I don't know. I'm going to pronounce that correctly. Spiliakos, I think. Spiliakos. Yeah. By Pete Sp- Good old Pete. Good old Pete Spiliakos. Uh, we didn't normalize Trump when he won the election. We normalized Trump when we overlooked the accusations against Bill Clinton. We didn't normalize lying when we elected a president who fibbed about whether his state company was still in business, because that's all Trump did. He just fibbed a little bit. We normalized lying when we decided that perjury and obstruction of justice were not high crimes when committed by a popular president, unquote. You know, that hasn't aged too well. Well, (laughs) none of this has, and none of it matters, because clearly all the articles sounding the alarm about Americans or us normalizing Trump are not going to be heeded by Republicans, and they don't affect Democrats because we're already there, we're already sold. And not even going to be read by the undecideds who are barely aware that any of this is going on. Yeah. So we're going to come back to the original question here. Who exactly is the audience and what exactly is the call to action? Well, it's obvious that much of this is that classic pundit open letter to no one in particular. Please click on this and applaud in the comments. (laughs) Right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I have to write this for the internet for, for my job. So I'm going to write it. So it's just, performative demonstrations of outrage to win the applause of an audience that is already outraged. It's kind of like the Rocky Horror Picture Show drift class. It's a sing-along where everybody already knows the words. Exactly. Exactly. Um, But some of it is clearly and correctly directed at the media. NPR's On the Media episode from May 12, 2016, which is, you know, On the Media, Mm -hmm. was How Not to Normalize Trump. Mm Mm-hmm. The press think issue from September 17th, 2017 was, quote, normalizing Trump, an incredibly brief explainer. A conflict in the journalist code was created by a president wholly unfit for the job. This article details six specific behaviors which Trump exhibits all the time and which journalists already know about. And yet, quote, If nothing the president says can be trusted, reporting what the president says becomes absurd. You can still do it, but it's hard to respect what you are doing. If the president doesn't know anything, the solemnity of the presidency becomes a joke. That's painful. If they can, people flee that kind of pain. In political journalism, there is enough room for the interpretive maneuver to do just that. Unquote. Yeah, the interpretive maneuver is called normalizing. Mm-hmm. And they do it all the time. But my personal favorite so far in this race to define normalization accurately and point it at the correct target, which is the media, is from January 29th, 2024. This very year, Blue Gal. This is from James Carvel, and it comes to us via Real Clear Politics. Quote, first of all, Donald Trump is an adjudicated rapist in the words of the judge, by ordinary definition, maybe he's just a sexual assaulter found by a jury. He's also an adjudicated business fraud. This is not normal. And so he must be identified as that at all times. And the press goes, Trump said this, Biden said that, Biden said this. No, no, no. It has to be reminded at every juncture. When I grew up, when I was in college during the civil rights era, that's how old I am. And you know what Pulitzer Prize winning journalists did when Martin Luther King said something? They didn't go to Bull Connor and get a response, and they won Pulitzer Prizes, unquote. Yeah. And this is the maddening part, the truly inexplicably maddening part. The only institution that is actually actively normalizing Donald Trump every day is the free and fair press, the mainstream media. And you can see it in A.G. Schulzberger using the power and prestige of his New York Times to act out his childish tantrum over Biden not giving the Times an exclusive interview. And you can see it it in Jeff Bezos trying to turn the Washington Post over to Rupert Murdoch henchman and just hoping no one would notice. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in the fire hose of daily, peevish, bosiderist garbage, which is still the mainstay of the mainstream media's coverage of the 2024 election. And you can also see the widespread contempt that decent people have for this peevish, both-siders garbage in the daily fire hose firing back of 
you must be fucking kidding me reactions across social media. So people do get it. People do understand this is just bullshit. And a lot of them yell right back via the internet, via, Mm -hmm. via Twitter or X or whatever it's called. But here's where we find the real mystery. Among all the decent people who are sick of this both siderist bullshit, there are former newspaper editors and there are current and former feature writers for major publications and a large number of political comms professionals, current and former. And yet to date, not one of them that I'm aware of has been willing to or were able to identify by name and title the senior decision makers or assignment editors or even the garbage headline writers within the mainstream media responsible for shoveling this shit into the public square every fucking day. Mm -hmm. They're mad. Mm -hmm. They're they're furious about it. They're angry about it. They want it to stop. But I don't hear James Fallows or Mark Jacobs saying, and Joey Jojo Jr., who's the copywriter or who's the editor, who's the assignment guy at XYZ newspaper, is the asshole who's doing this. Mm-hmm. Here's his title. Here's his mailing address. Let him know what you think. Yeah. There was more responsibility in the opening credits of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. He's been <laughs> sacked. The yeah. person who was sacked him has been sacked. He's also been sacked. The stat, we, we deeply res- apologize for that. Yeah. And, right. And, and then the, then the mo- then came the moose jokes, which I you know never yeah. get old. Yeah, they don't. But and, it, and I also want to point everyone back to an earlier episode of our show where we talk about There is no need to have a debate with Donald Trump. No. And that was uh, that came out because the mainstream media wrote a letter begging both sides to please have a debate for the sake of American democracy. Ratings for the sake of. But it's ratings. Exactly. It's It's ratings. Mm -hmm. And if Trump backs out has a crisis or blames Biden for changing the rules and lies about it, which is what he always does. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know, I don't expect the mainstream media to call him out for it. No, but that's what they rightly should do. And I know I'm using that word should, but if they're (laughs) so desperate for the ratings that come from a debate, they should definitely blame the person who, who blows up their ratings they oh, know you know and, well, and they diminishes can't. their ratings and they can't. they can't because his presence is what drives their ratings up yeah and yeah. i figure look i figure it kind of like this if donald trump can literally get away with threatening the lives of judges and jurors mm-hmm. and witnesses mm-hmm. yeah and just do it openly or do it through his surrogates and call the judicial system corrupt and call his uh, the 2020 election stolen and get away with it we should at least be able to make life a little bit unpleasant for the people that keep pushing this both sides garbage into Mm -hmm. our face and ruining the media. I want to know who they are. I I don't care where they live. I don't want to touch their families, nothing like that. But I want them to be professionally embarrassed every time they walk out the door. I want them to be where big signs have their heads shaved that says I collaborated in a virtual kind of way, in in a metaphorical kind of way. I want people to know who they are. As much as people know who these sexual predators are that got fired from their jobs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, Bill mm-hmm. O'Reilly didn't work at Fox anymore because he was a fucking sexual predator. There's a yeah. whole list of people you can name who got sacked because of a behavior that was antithetical to the corporate culture. Why is shoving both sides do it garbage into the faces of the public every day not antithetical to the because idea of a free the product? Press? Because exactly. that's the product. That's why. Yeah. yeah. And why won't note, our, drift class? And, well, and why won't our friends in social media who are equally outraged name names? That's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. On that note, drift class, let's do a news roundup. Yeah. President yep. Bidening continues. That'll calm you right down, Blue Cow. No, That'll it won't. Calm you right down. <laughs> I promise you, it won't. President Biden announced executive actions to protect some five hundred thousand immigrants without legal status in the U.S. from deportation. Woo-hoo. The new The new policy will shield undocumented individuals if they lived in the U.S. for 10 or more years and are married to a U.S. citizen. The protection also provides a streamlined path to citizenship. And by that, we mean seven years instead of 17. Don't let anyone tell you that Biden is flooding the zone with immigrants. About 500,000 undocumented spouses and 50,000 undocumented stepchildren of U.S. citizens are expected to be eligible to apply. 
Biden also announced a policy that makes DACA recipients, so-called dreamers, eligible for work visas rather than temporary work authorization. Today's a good day, Biden said. Yeah, that's a good day. Under the heading of messaging, this is a mass email press release from the Biden campaign from earlier this week. And wow, uh, we're just going to read it in full because it's awesome. For immediate release, June 17th, 2024, Trump's debate lies show how scared he is. Donald Trump is a liar and a fraud. His campaign is full of liars and frauds. And their desperate leaks and lies to the right-wing media only underscores how scared Donald Trump is to debate. This is Donald's debate playbook. Lies, distractions, and deceit. Donald Trump and his campaign are scared because they can't defend his record, personal conduct, or extreme agenda in front of the American people. Donald can't defend that he's a criminal who's been convicted of 34 felonies, was found liable for sexual assault, committed financial fraud, and is only out for himself. Donald can't defend his endorsement of state abortion bans, including ones that track women's pregnancies, threaten access to IVF, and punish women. Donald can't defend that he has the worst jobs record of any modern president and oversaw the largest increase in the murder rate on record. Donald can't defend his economic agenda of higher prices for working Americans and social security cuts. Also, he can give corporations and billionaires more tax handouts. Donald can't defend that he's unhinged about losing by 7 million votes to Joe Biden in 2020, is proposing to be a dictator on day one, and a violent bloodbath when he loses again in November. Donald can't defend his actions on or leading up to January 6th. Donald can't defend his extreme Supreme Court nominees. Donald can't defend being a lifelong racist who failed black and brown America as president. That wins a don't sugarcoat it award for me right there. Yeah, right there. Donald can't defend wanting to rip away health care protections from more than 100 million Americans. Yeah, including us. Mm -hmm. Donald can't defend insulting veterans, law enforcement, and the American people. We are at an inflection point as a nation. Our freedoms, our democracy, our middle class, our leadership on the world stage are all at stake. To lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future of what America can and should be. Donald Trump does not have a vision of anything beyond the failure he sees in the mirror. More goodness, this is a statement from T.J. Ducklow, Biden-Harris 2024 Senior Advisor for Communications. Donald Trump has been playing games around debates for years, lying about negotiations, bailing at the last minute, and making insane accusations about moderators and microphones, all because he's terrified to defend the dangerous and extreme things he's done and promises to do again. Joe Biden will be at the debate standing up for our democracy, our freedoms, and the American people. If Trump would like to sit down behind his podium, he can, but we're worried he may fall asleep if he shows up at all, because yes. he's a pussy. Yes. They didn't this, say. No, no, but they did. Just read very lightly between the lines, and you hear... <laughs> A bunch of liberal bloggers using the word fuck for 20 mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in Bill O'Reilly news. Now, you remember Bill O'Reilly? I Bill do. I yeah, do. There was a guy named Bill O'Reilly. He's now out of the cult, Blue Gal. So oh, sad. no. Dan Bongino, who is in the cult and who was fired from Fox News for being way too Bongino, has turned on Bill O'Reilly, proving, as Ron Filipkowski noted on social media, Paul Ryan, Bob Good, Mike Pence, Liz Cheney, Megyn Kelly, Bill O'Reilly, and on and on. Sooner or later, everyone is a rhino traitor. Yep. The Arizona 8 Republican congressional primary is getting real nasty between 2022 ticket mates Blake Masters and Abe Hamada. I guess they were on the ticket together for governor and lieutenant governor, and now they're running against each other in this congressional primary. And Blake Masters has an ad up right now basically calling Hamada, who is Muslim, a terrorist sympathizer. Mm -hmm. So much for Reagan's 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican, Drew Glass. 
I remember way back in 2022 when they looked at each other and said, did we just become best friends? <laughs> I think we did. <laughs> yeah, that never lasts. It never lasts. The judge overseeing convicted felon Donald Trump's trial involving the willful retention of classified documents in violation of the Espionage Act refused to hand off the case to a more experienced judge, despite two more senior colleagues on the federal bench in Florida urging her to do so. Two judges called Judge Eileen Cannon shortly after she, she took the case. The first told her the case would be better handled by a juror closer to Miami's busiest courthouse, which had a secure facility approved to hold the sort of highly classified information that might be used in the case. Makes sense, right? Right. The second call came from Cecilia Altanaga, the chief judge in the Southern District of Florida, who told Cannon that the optics of her overseeing the trial would be bad. And Judge Cannon more or less told them both to fuck off. From Melinda French Gates, the former Mrs. Bill Gates, I've never endorsed a presidential candidate before, but this year's election stands to be so enormously consequential for women and families that this time I can't stay quiet. Women deserve a leader who cares about the issues they face and is committed to protecting their safety, their health, their economic power, their reproductive rights, and their ability to freely and fully participate in a functioning democracy. In this election, the contrast couldn't be greater and the stakes couldn't be higher. I will be voting for President Biden. Yeah. And here's a fun fact. Melissa French Gates' net worth is $11.1 billion with a B dollars. So maybe, seeing as how she's concerned for our democracy, maybe consider devoting the interest on the interest of that vast fortune to, you know, funding a genuine liberal media. Not going to happen. Just a thought. Just a thought. In the Trump Veep stakes, North Carol excuse me, North Dakota governor, billionaire Doug Burgum is making big moves, Strickglass. This week, Burgum said, under Joe Biden, we are actually living under a dictatorship today. Yeah. Yeah. He wants that job so bad. He wants it so bad. Meanwhile, in Louisiana, Louisiana's Republican governor signed legislation requiring public schools to display the Ten Commandments in every goddamn classroom. Quote, this bill mandates the display of the Ten Commandments in every classroom, public, elementary, secondary, and post-education schools in the state of Louisiana, because if you want to respect the rule of law, you got to start from the original lawgiver, which was Moses. Well, no, it wasn't. There's a whole bunch of others, including Roman ones, but fuck you. This is what, that's what Governor Jeff Landry had to say. Meanwhile, civil rights groups vowed to challenge the law in court because the organizers noted that the new law is blatantly unconstitutional. And when he signed this bill, a child standing immediately behind his chair collapsed and fainted. Yeah. And he didn't notice. Well, that's, that, caring about kids is so New Testament, Blue Gal. Uh-huh. He's uh -huh. a more Old Testament kind of guy. So you can't yeah. expect him to, you know. An amazing Live video. the Gospels. Mm -hmm. The New York Court of Appeals rejected convicted felon Trump's appeal of the gag order in the election interference case involving falsified business records in which he was convicted last month. The court wrote that Trump's appeal was dismissed because, quote, no substantial constitutional question is directly involved, unquote. As a result, Trump's gag order, which bars him from speaking about jurors, witnesses, and other parties involved in the Manhattan Supreme Court case, remains in effect. And the person that we refer to in this house as my lawyer, That's Andrew right. Weissman, Mm -hmm. on his podcast this week, said that it is um, likely that the gag order will be modified so that Trump can talk about Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, both of whom are public figures talking about Trump and the trial on their podcasts on, in public. And so, yeah, he'll probably be allowed to respond to them, mm -hmm. Trump will, but uh, jurors and other witnesses, no. No, no, no. Uh, it's just absurd that you would even think about attacking a juror after a case is decided. Right. Because right. after once you're out that door, you're completely at the whim of the mob. So right. sorry. Anybody yeah. else want to volunteer for the job? No. Um, yeah. yeah. As a complete aside, you might have noticed that we do append the, the words convicted felon in front of <laughs> Donald Trump and Trump's name as often as possible. 
I truly believe, Blue Gal, that mm-hmm. convicted felon Donald Trump is the 2024 version of where's the WMD asshole yeah, yeah. from 2005 and 2004 and 2006. Yeah, they, there's yeah. no answer to that question. There's yep. no answer other than hysterical denial and look over there and, and shut rigged. up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the House, Ex- House Ethics Committee, that's difficult to say, Blue Gal. The House Ethics Committee is expanding its investigation into Matt Gates amid allegations of sexual misconduct and illegal drug use. No, not Matt Gates. Yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be like we did with Trump and convicted felon Trump. We're going to be, uh, you know, adjudicated sex pest and drug user Matt Gates is going yeah. to come, come yeah. to be. All right. The Supreme Court overturned a federal ban on bump stocks, which allow semi-automatic rifles to be fired like fully automatic machine guns. They say it's Congress's job to change the law to ban those bump stocks. Uh, We'll see if Congress can do that if we elect Democrats. The court split six to three along ideological lines. Yeah, because Republicans are objectively in favor of mass murder. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, House Republicans passed defense policy legislation that would restrict access to abortion and transgender medical care in the military and eliminate all diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at the Pentagon because they support the troops, Blue Gal. They support Mm -hmm. the troops. House Republicans, not for long. 38 seats is my bet. (laughs) I love that. They're going to lose 38 seats is, is what the number I put down. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week we have a dog and a cat. Dexter the dog and Ringo the cat are quite the pair. And in this picture, they are having a rather intense conversation. And Ringo the cat appears to be in charge, even though Ringo is much smaller than uh, Dexter. Than Napoleon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This beautiful pair are brought to us by our fake sponsor, for freshly poured cat food. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat or dog will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Dexter and Ringo, they really are a pair, at our Facebook page and website proleftpod.com. And you can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write to us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service, go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Please don't forget our gourmet coffee guidelines. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, go ahead and buy one for us. Buy two. We're not picky. Buy three. This is not charity. This is our job. So if you can spare five bucks a month, please spare five bucks a month at patreon.com forward slash pro left pod. Also, please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please convince someone else to listen. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties say rest in power, Donald Sutherland, the original pro from Dover. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the humping and the popping and the loving, loving, loving. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying and the fellow with the switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2024-25, GGBG Productions.